eating all the time, you're stimulating your insulin all the time, insulin stays high, stays high, never gets a chance to come down. And because your insulin doesn't come back down again, you're always in a storage mode. Yeah. This high insulin is the problem we've hormonally changed because we're eating too frequently. We're not designed to eat, eat that frequently. Insulin's supposed to go up, then come back down again, up and back down. We stay up all the time, so your body develops, in a simple terms, insulin resistance. Now, the next time you eat, you need even more insulin because just like wearing a jacket, you first feel it, then you don't feel it. The body, when it has high levels of insulin all the time, it becomes insensitive to it. And that's what's happening. We are a hormonally modified human being now. We're becoming insulin resistant. And this insulin resistance results in higher and higher insulin levels. And that's the problem I found. And I just want to digress a little bit. And I'll tell you how I came to this. In my practice, what was happening is patients were coming in with heart attacks and hardening of the arteries and angina. And I said, okay, there must be a cause. And I looked for it. And the cholesterol most of the time was okay. Blood pressure was okay. They were not diabetic. And I see all this hardening of the arteries. And I'm wondering why. So about 12, 15 years ago, I, I started doing sugar tests on them. And I found that they actually had mild diabetes, what we call glucose intolerance or impaired glu uh, fasting glucose. So the sugars were just slightly high, but not enough to make them a diabetic. So I said, okay, fine. So I should put these patients on something to sensitize them and make them better. And I put them on metformin. And I got a lot of resistance from a lot of physicians in the community plus patients. Uh, but the outcomes were better. They, they actually did better. Then I started doing insulin testing in my office. And I started doing this when I read uh, some information from, um, uh, from a, a physician uh, who wrote a book on, on, on insulin, and he, Dr. Kraft. So it's yeah. called the Kraft yeah. test. So now what we do is we give them sugar water, patients, and we measure the, the sugar levels going up and back down again. And said, okay, it went up a little bit, not too bad. But I looked at the insulin response, and it was massive in these patients. So I took 100 patients. And I saw that they were making so much insulin. And I said, this is ridiculous. Why are you making so much insulin? Well, that insulin resistance. And then I linked the fact that it's the high insulin level that's actually causing the hardening of the arteries because the sugar levels are okay. Of course, what happens is over time, it's taking a gallon of insulin to bring your sugar levels under control. Eventually, even that's not enough. Yeah, so then the yeah. sugar level goes up and then they go to the doctor and say, oh, your sugar levels are high or your hemoglobin A1C level is high. Now you're a diabetic. Well, guess what? It's too late. You already have all the hardening of the arteries. You've done so much damage to your arteries. You probably did it for 15 to 20 years. And that's the discovery. And that's what really motivated me to make these changes in my patients to say that, look, you know, I got to get that insulin level down. And it is that high insulin level that really motivated me yeah, yeah. to really do the fasting program. Because I said, okay, how am I going to get insulin levels down? Yeah, how, how do yeah. I do that? I don't have a drug. So that's what, look, the whole thing comes down to insulin. For me, it was. Now, as things happen, I discovered more and more fun things in this fantastic journey. But the bottom line is, it was the high insulin level that really got me into this. Because I found that when I brought the insulin levels down, my coronary artery disease, atherosclerosis, just went down. Patients did so much better. And that high insulin level, the only thing I know that really helps to bring that insulin level down, besides metformin and a few other drugs really is fasting. Yeah. Because when you don't eat, guess what? You don't make insulin. That's it. Your yeah. insulin levels yeah. plummet. And then the next time you eat, you make insulin, but a much less amount because yeah. you're not sensitive. So this fasting, I got into it through this way. Not because I've, I, I just wanted to make them reduce weight. Yeah. Not yeah. because I just wanted to reduce blood pressure. It was really the insulin that got me into fasting. Then, of course, I discovered as time went on that, oh my God, the blood pressures were coming down and I realized that insulin is a vasoconstrictor. It reduces nitric oxide in your blood vessels. So therefore, your blood vessels can't dilate. Now, that brings me to hypertension. That I said, oh my God, I was taught and you were taught that 95% of hypertension is essential. And this very word essential, <laughs> there's nothing essential about hypertension. You don't need it. So 
I should, 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 we just, should, we, should we explain to non-medical listeners what, what does that term essential mean when we say essential hypertension? What do we mean by that? It means we don't know the cause of it. It's idiopathic. Idiopathic is another word we use, uh, which means we don't really know clearly what the cause is. It's just something that just happens. So this essential hypertension is not really essential. You don't really need it. And I found through my own experiences here that the fasting brought the blood pressures down. And I said, okay, so what's the correlation? It's insulin. I started reading more about insulin. And sure enough, when you give patients an insulin shot, the blood pressure goes up. Yeah, you yeah. take them off insulin, blood pressures come down. Insulin causes nitric oxide depletion in the blood vessels. Nitric oxide, by the way, is a vasodilator. Okay? Nitric oxide is a natural endogenous product that makes your blood vessels dilate. And then when nitric oxide goes down, the vasoconstrict. This is a dynamic state that you're supposed to have. You walk into a cold room, your vasoconstrict. Uh, that means your blood vessels go down. When you go into a hot room, your vasodilate. That's a normal response. This nitric oxide is most essential in our body. It is so important for blood vessels that, in fact, there was a Nobel Prize awarded for this nitric oxide, as you know. Yeah. So for the audience to realize that insulin, when it comes down, your nitric oxide production goes up, and therefore you vasodilate appropriately. Your blood vessels are not imprisoned anymore, and blood pressure started coming down. I said, this, this, this is amazing, yeah. because for yeah. the first time in my life, I felt that the patients were doing something that was actually bringing their blood pressures down. I mean, we always tell patients who have high blood pressure, okay, avoid excess of salt and go do some exercises. and Those are fine because they also can improve nitric oxide production. But this was a very powerful one. When I brought that insulin levels down on these patients through fasting, blood pressures just plummeted, and I had to actually take patients off blood pressure medications. Yeah. So yeah. that was a huge thing that I found with the insulin. So fasting seemed to me the, the best way to, to, to really make the patient's blood pressures come down, and I found that the weights came down. And the question is, why did the weight come down? Well, insulin, in the bottom line for all your listeners, insulin just is a storage molecule. Yeah, puts yeah. everything in storage. So when the insulin levels come down, the storage padlocks are taken off. So your fat can now be mobilized. Yeah. Now yeah. there's, of course, I can go into all the enzymes that are involved and, and the, and the hormone-dependent lipase, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the bottom line is when insulin levels come down, now your fat pads are available yeah. for yeah. metabolism. And I found that the fats just started coming off the patients. And when I would look at these patients who would do the fasting program, I'd look at them and they, they look great. It's not like their faces are all, you know, the, the excess of skin hanging off or they have skin hanging off their arms. No. Fasting patients seemed to lose weight in a more beautiful way. They, they were actually losing fat, but they were also losing the right amount of skin as well. Yeah. Because, yeah. you see, prior to this, prior to this, I used to tell patients, okay, you're going to cut your calories to only 850 calories a day. And you're going to have uh, four meals a day. Each one is going to be this much. And the patients would come back. Sure, they lost some weight. They would lose, lose a lot, actually, sometimes. But they would look terrible. They would look absolutely terrible. Their faces, their skin, and, and, and plus they were miserable because they just never enjoyed, they didn't feel good yeah, eating yeah. small amounts of food frequently. This advice that we gave patients previously, that, hey, Cut your calories down by eating four small meals a day or nibble throughout the day. Totally wrong in clinical experience. They lost temporary weight. They all would put it back on again. Did it for years. I did it for 15 years and I was sick and tired of it. They would come back miserable saying, Doc, my life's miserable. I only eat this much and I just feel terrible. I'm hungry all the time. And I look at them, they surely even look miserable. And their skin was just... So when patients were fasting, they would come back and they were laughing. They were, they were so happy. Yeah, yeah. The mood was better. And I said, well, why is this guy's mood so good? He hasn't eaten for two days now. And he says, Doc, my mood is better than it ever was before. I'm sleeping better as well. Uh, and he empowered himself. And I said, no, wait, wait, this is psychological. He's just, you know, he was able to do it, so he's feeling good about himself. He says, no, doc, I, I do feel good that I was able to do it, and, and I, I'm self-empowered, 
but also they felt better. And then, of course, as I do the research, I see that there are many substances that are produced during fasting, and one of them is BDNF, which is a big word for brain-derived neurotropic factor. What that really basically means is, look, when you are fasting, does nature want you to just crawl into your, into your cave and fall asleep and, and just, 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 just die? No. Nature wants you to go out there, find your kill or your, your, your prey or, your, or your, find your berries or something. So it actually makes your brain more alert and, ju and juvenates your brain. And you actually, now there's data to show that you can actually grow new cells as well in prolonged fasting. So what happens is that you actually become more wide-eyed and bushy-tailed. Yeah. And that's what yeah. I saw with the patients too. That they, were, they, they were so happy when they walked into my office. You're walking to a cardiologist's office laughing and joking. This is fantastic. So, and then, so that's something. And then I found that the, the, the energy levels... They just not only felt better mentally and, 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 and the mood was better, but they said that they moved around better. So I said, what does that mean? They said, well, look, my aches and pains went away. I said, come on. I said, yes, I only lost 15 pounds so far, but my joint pains are all gone. Now, wait a second. Why is that? Why did the joint pains go away? You don't take off that much weight to take them off your knee. Well, there's inflammation. And I found that inflammation went down in these patients. Yeah, so I said, okay, yeah. so how do I measure inflammation? So I looked at the CRP levels on these patients. And I found that the CRP is a blood test. In the, and your audience would know that this is a test that we do to look for inflammation, microinflammation in your blood vessels. And I found that they were coming down. Now, you know how hard it was for me to bring these inflammatory markers down? I mean, you know, we give patients statins and, and that does bring down CRP. But... I found that these patients who are fasting, the CRP's levels came down. And perhaps a lot of the inflammation in the joints was getting better because the inflammation went down. So I said, okay, that's fine. What else are you feeling? I said, well, you know what? My, my stomach feels good too. I said, wait a second. Come on, guys. I mean, you're fasting and how can this be happening to you? I said, yeah, less bloating. Uh, my bowel movements are better. Um, I'm not getting so gassy and I don't get that fatigue after eating. You know, I just, oh, I just feel so down. Of course, they're not eating, but when they do eat after the meal, they feel so much better. So they are eating after when they break the fast, but they're feeling better. Their guts are better. Their joints are better. Their minds are better. I just said, oh, God, this is crazy. This is crazy. So that's what really, yeah, <laughs> I got yeah. so excited about fasting, as you can tell. I just, it is an amazing journey. Yeah, it's, you know, what's incredible is hearing you talk about this with this incredible passion. You know, you have seen really, really sick patients. You've been inside their body. You're, you're obviously... You know, there was there was clearly a frustration at some point. You know, why am I keep doing this with all these patients? They keep coming in. What else can I do? But what you're talking about with fasting, it's not giving more things to someone. Oh, you've got to add this into your life. You've got to take more medications, take more supplements, go uh, and go to the gym more, right? Because most of the things we advise, we're asking them to do more, add more things in. Actually, this is very, very simple at its core. We're asking them to do less. We're saying, actually, don't cook. Um, we'll get we'll get into the specifics, but I'm just saying sort of 30,000 foot view is, it's kind of like, well, I'm going to save you some money. You can eat less. I'm going to save you some time. You don't have to cook. Uh, this is going to help improve your sleep, your cognitive function. It, it's kind of, it's very interesting. It's something so simple that pretty much every religion has as part of its kind of culture and tradition. Yet it's so alien to us in the way that we currently live or as doctors, the way we currently practice, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, on this journey, they find out something about themselves. Yeah, yeah. And I'm talking about what they find out. They find out that they are not the hunger. They are not the craving. That they are something. I mean, I'm just going to say in first terms, I am something beyond my hunger. I am beyond my body. I'm beyond my habits. I've suddenly realized that I am in charge. That I don't have to have breakfast. If I'm not hungry, I don't have to have breakfast. And now Doc tells me that's good for me. 
lunch comes around, are you hungry? Or have you been a victim of just, it's one o'clock, so I have to eat? So when the patients suddenly realize that, gosh, I don't have to eat because I'm not hungry. Of course, if you're not hungry. And now they're empowering themselves. Yeah, they realize yeah. that there's another part of themselves, a real inner amnes, my, my awareness, the, the real me, which is beyond my body, beyond my feelings, beyond my sensations, and I have control over it. Now, I found that that seems to empower patients more because you start them out first doing this, 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 this dietary stuff, okay, learn how to just skip meals. Then all of a sudden, it roller coasters, and they themselves become so empowered. They say, whoa, 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 what have you done? He says, well, you know, Doc, you told me to fast. I haven't eaten for 48 hours. I said, yeah, but I didn't tell you, tell you 48 hours. So what I'm saying is that it empowers them even yeah, more yeah. because they realize, yes, I have control. I have regained my control over my eating habits. I don't have to eat because it's uh, one o'clock in the afternoon. I have to go downstairs to the cafeteria to eat. I don't have to do that if I'm not hungry. And when I am hungry, my ghrelin levels have gone up. They'll stay up for about an hour, Doc told me, and then it'll come right back down and my hunger will be gone. So now I'm empowering myself that, yep, I can do it. I'm going to wait it out for one hour. I drink a glass of water. Doc told me to drink a glass of water. And yeah, sure enough, my hunger went away. I moved on. Yeah, Doc yeah. told me to keep my mind busy. Go and do your chores at one o'clock. Go do your shopping at one o'clock. Go pay your bills at one o'clock. And your time will pass. And before you know it, you'll be back to work at two o'clock. And you'll have n no problems till the evening. Yeah, so I yeah. think that self-empowering the patients this way. They're taking control and they're looking back and they're getting positive feedback. Oh yeah, I have regained control. Yeah, yeah. If you enjoyed that clip, here's another powerful clip that I think you are really going to enjoy.